Hi, I'm Brent Stafford, and this is RegWatch by RegulatorWatch.com. Being a victim of a car accident can be a traumatic experience with long-lasting impacts after the crash itself. Physical injuries, emotional distress, and financial burdens can follow, causing immense pain and disruption in daily life. But while support is available through medical treatment and physical therapy, obstacles are in place that block the road to recovery. And in the province of Ontario, the auto insurance industry appears to be one of the biggest obstacles. Joining us today to discuss the challenges facing victims of auto accidents in Ontario is Rona DeRush from FAIR, the FAIR Association of Victims for Accident Insurance Reform. Rona, thanks for joining us today on RegWatch. Thank you very much for having me. So Rona, according to your website, FAIR is a grassroots nonprofit organization that advocates on behalf of victims who have been injured in a motor vehicle accident and have struggled dealing with the auto insurance system in Ontario. Now, that's a very specific and distinct mission to tackle, Rona. Why the focus on the auto insurance industry? Well, Ontario has 10 million drivers, and so all of us are at risk of not being able to recover after a car accident. And having had a very negative experience myself, um, this is what has led me to uh, to join up with FAIR. It was already uh, started when I got there. They started up in 2011. A um, bunch of uh, car accident uh, claimants started there. And I think that there's a lot of work to be done. I mean, we, we all pay very high premiums right across Canada. We pay a big bucks for insurance. So we have the right to expect that we'll have coverage when we need it. Now, is there something particular about the auto insurance industry in Ontario that makes things a little more pernicious? Well, I, I, I think so. I mean, insurers certainly feel free to deny claims uh, at every opportunity. Uh, so I think because we have so many drivers here, and I think we're sort of a testing ground in, in what they'll try across the country. So I think we're sort of sitting ducks. Um, and, and they have plenty of, of excuses that they use to, to not pay us. And so that needs to be called out. Because we generally are um, siloed in the sense that each claim is, is different. There's no larger place where we all meet and, and we can discuss how to make things better. Uh, FAIR is the only organization that really tries to address this um, this interaction. And uh, we try to bring our influence to improve auto insurance and access to these benefits. We pay for them, they should be there. Now, if you could describe for us the impact of these kinds of injuries, what are they? And, and you know, how hard is it to get over them? Well, some people are very uh, seriously injured. And, and so you have all kinds of therapies that might be needed. Uh, in order to maximize your recovery. Um, some people will never go get back to where they originally started before a car accident, but we all, you know, we want to do the best that we can to get back to our lives. So the idea that insurers aren't always stepping up, uh, they do for some people and for others not. Um, so it's uh, more and more of the care for accident victims is being downloaded to the taxpayers or indeed to your the people themselves that this happened to. So since we don't put money away, just in case we get injured and we pay very high premiums thinking that we'll be covered, it's, I think it's incumbent on anybody who's been in the system who has managed to complete the claim that, that they participate in making sure that the, the person down the road also can get what they need for recovery. Now, does the auto insurance industry provide enough benefits to cover rehabilitation? I certainly don't think so. And I think uh, anybody who's been in a claim would say no. Um, we have several thresholds in Ontario. Uh, a threshold is a, an, an area that you have to pass through in order to access higher and higher benefits. But it starts off with what they call a minor injury guideline. And in Ontario, about 80% of all claims are captured in this minor injury guideline and that means that you only have $3,500 for your med rehab. Now $3,500 certainly isn't very much by today's standards. Uh, you know nothing is cheap and that certainly COVID has made that even more clear. Uh, so I don't think that we have enough. We need a, a higher minor injury guideline if we're going to keep that guideline but ideally we would get rid of all these thresholds 
I think people, when they read their insurance documents, see that they have a million dollars coverage. So they think that they have access to all of that coverage. Now, it's a big surprise to find out that, oh, no, you have $3,500. And if you want more than that, you're going to have to go to a hearing and you're going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to hire a lawyer and you're going to have to put some effort in. And both of those things, when you're injured, are not ideal. So I think we've got essentially an empty promise of coverage. Uh, for most people, they have to fight. A lot of people never get any more than 3,500. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they've reached their maximum possible recovery. It just means that the insurers are, are not paying any more than that 3,500. It is the lowest minor injury guideline in Canada. All the other provinces have far more uh, dollars available for this rehabilitation process. So it's an unfair system in Ontario. Now, the minor injury guideline is actually something that we've been covering. It's at the focal point of our coverage on this issue over the last several months. We've been following along with uh, the health service providers category that uh, is governed by the Financial Services Regulatory Authority of Ontario, which is the regulator that is in, uh, responsible for this. And the health service providers, which are the physiotherapists and the chiropractors and the massage therapists, there's over 20,000 of them in Ontario who provide treatment and care for victims of auto accidents. They're, the sole fee structure is governed under that minor injury guideline. So it's not just the you know patients and the victims that have things capped. The actual providers are capped too as well. Yes, and it's also inadequate. I mean, they, they have not had any increases in the amount that they're getting paid, I think, since 2004, uh, pardon me, 2014. And that's a long time to go without an increase. I mean, life has not gotten cheaper in, in the last, you know, 11 years. It's everything has gone up. And I think they're being unfairly targeted uh, and their wages are being suppressed because, the less treatment providers that are in this system, the less that people will be able to take advantage of that kind of care. So it, it all leads to insurers saving dollars and claimants getting less for their money. Now, as you said, if 80% of the injuries fall under this minor injury guideline uh, with regard to accidents in Ontario, it sounds like that this is the, the spot where they're really trying to maintain some control on costs. I would, I would say so. Uh, they certainly targeted this particular group and, and the Financial Services Regulatory Authority, they only oversee their billing practices. So there are people that run offices and there are people that, and there are large companies that do this and also small ones, and they're all getting the same amount of, of, of dollars. And so if it's capped at 3,500, I mean, that isn't much to operate with. And they're all challenged, I think, in terms of um, where do, what portion of the money is the, for the cost of care are the insurers going to pay them? Because you're accessing not just the auto insurance um, dollars of the 3500 you're also um, getting money from long-term disability that you might have at work. Uh, Ontario auto insurers are payers of the last resort which means you have to exhaust all manner of uh, income to pay for your damages before they'll step up. So here, if you get injured, you have to apply for EI, you have to, um, you could end up on OW or Ontario Works, which is a welfare system, or Ontario Disability Support is where most people end up. So none of those include any, any type of treatment. So when your insurer turns down treatment, and you've run out of money, you've also run out of options, and you've run out of off the road of recovery. So it's affecting, I think, the treatment providers. I mean, it would be very difficult to watch this. Um, they're also quite invested in, in the clients that they serve. Uh, and, and it's a, a terrible thing to see people not get to where they need to go. And there's a huge social cost in this as well. So I think it's, uh, I think it's important that the public know how little they'll actually get after a car accident. And so that they'll speak to their MPPs and that they'll be aware when they're taking risks on the road, even with the weather, uh, those sorts of things, all those decisions, you should always be informed about what kind of coverage you have and whether or not you'll ever even get the coverage. I mean, some people simply don't. 
Yeah, as a victim's advocate, does it concern you with regard to the fact that the health service providers have not received, you know, an increase in their fees in almost 10 years? And, you know, there's not really a clear path to how to fix that. Well, it does, because you see a migration of treatment providers uh, migrating out of Ontario Auto Insurance because um, the WSIB, uh, Workman's Compensation, and uh, Veterans Affairs both pay more than Ontario's auto accident uh, insurance does. And these are traumatically injured people. It's sudden. It's not like you, you slowly degrade. It's sudden. You need sudden access. Um, you need uh, people to coordinate your, your care. It's a, it's a complicated system with complicated injuries. And so some people are catastrophically injured, which means they've reached a level to which at least 55% of their whole person is affected by what's happened to them. And those people are often targeted by insurers because it's going to cost them the most money. They're the ones that are trying to access the million dollars in coverage. And it's unfortunate that this is just a small group of people, but the most injured people in the system are the ones who are most harmed by insurers who are not paying up what they promised to pay. So FISRA, the regulator, financial in the Financial Services Regulatory Authority of Ontario, how do you characterize the way in which FISRA manages the system? Well, FISRA seems to have a, a, a very narrow focus, let's put it that way, that uh, they're looking at it from a front end point of view, which is, uh, does this look like it's a good package? Does it sound like it's a good package of coverage? But there's been little to no interest about what happens to claimants in the system. So if you pull people and you ask people, you know, how is your, how do you feel about your insurance? They will tell you that, oh, the premiums are too high. But the ones that have actually tried to use the product and who have made a claim will have a totally different uh, perspective on it because they are the ones that really use the product. And that is that simply isn't going well for uh, Ontario. And you can't you can't just dress it up, make sure it sounds good and it, it'll lower get lower premiums without taking an interest on are people actually getting anything at all. And that's where the the disconnect is, and that's where the problem is, is that FISRA will not look at the end result for people. Do you believe the system is unfairly biased against the injured person? Yes, I do. I don't think the system is set up so much for claimants as it is for insurers. This is a profit-driven business, private insurance, uh, and the bottom line is what decides what people will, will get. So I don't think that the regulator or anyone involved in the system at all puts the consumers first. They might use that language, but it's not happening. Because if it was, you would take an interest in what is happening down the road. That are people getting what they need? Are they reaching maximum recovery? And if the answer to that is no, then you need to do a better job at the front end of the system. And that's what we want FISRA to do, is to take a look at what's happening down the road so they can fix it at the front. And what role does FISRA play in perpetuating this bias? I believe that they are. I think it does uh, perpetuate the problem because you, you simply put on blinders. And one of the problems with, with FISRA is the lack of consumer input there. Um, they do have a consumer advisory panel. I sit on that panel. Uh, and it's an advisory position, but you don't have to take the advice. The, so that, that's a problem. So they are perpetuating it. And they, they don't have enough people that are outside the industry in their house to tell them what's actually going on. When people are pulled about auto insurance, it's, as I said, if you just ask people, you know, what do they care about? They'll say premiums are too high. You need to ask the people that have done, who have gone through the system, to really gauge about where you should focus your energies on. And if you don't ask, and FISRA won't ask, uh, or won't take an interest, then you don't get that focus. If you don't put the focus where it needs to be, you'll never have a high quality product. So it's not fair to say to Ontario drivers that you have to buy this product, you have coverage when you need it, when that isn't true. It is simply not true. You get coverage if you get lucky. 
because somewhere between one third and 50% of all claimants are not going to get what they need. And that's a lot of people. There's generally somewhere between 40 and 50,000 people a year in Ontario that are involved in car accidents. So that means that's a lot of people looking for recovery and they'll end up being supported by the taxpayers and not the private insurer that they paid. Rona, from what we can tell, FISRA has been less than clear about what they can and cannot do with regard to setting fees, making changes, real changes. And earlier this year, FISRA CEO Mark White stated publicly that the regulator is not involved in the fee schedule for treatment providers, yet it now appears that they're acknowledging that they can actually make some changes. What do you make of this? Well, I think there's probably some confusion here. Uh, now, the CEO position was created when the Financial Services Commission of Ontario, or FISCO, was dismantled and FISRA, the Financial Services Regulatory Authority, took over the auto insurance file. Now, prior to FISRA being created, these decisions about increasing wages for uh, treatment providers and, and minimum amounts paid out were decided by the superintendent of insurance. Now, that position seems to have migrated into the CEO of FISRA's pocket. It's not exactly named anymore. So I think that's where the confusion comes from. But I do believe that the power to change this actually is at the regulator. Because if he doesn't have it, if he doesn't have that power, then he should be looking for who does. And I, I believe it lies at FISRA. So they need to do some sort of soul uh, searching or perhaps look in the mirror and figure out what it is that they need to do to make sure that people are paid properly and fairly and that accident victims have access to quality medical rehabilitation treatments. Because at the end of the day, if you're a treatment provider, you're already looking for a door out. Auto insurance is not an easy file to run. They make life very difficult for treatment providers. It's get this money from your long-term disability. It's get this money from us. You know, how much is the, how much can we get out of the public system? There are all these slicing and dicing all the time when it comes to auto insurance. So it is not an easy system for treatment providers to work in. And I respect that. And that it, it is, I think, too, um, difficult to treat people that are, are so injured and so traumatized maybe even more so by the system that they find themselves in post-accident than they are from the actual accident itself. And I think a lot of people have, have said variations of that to me, and I would agree with that because it's traumatic just trying to get through the, the claim system that lasts a very long time. So you can fight uh, to get one treatment, and then when you when somebody recommends another treatment for you, you got to go back again and fight for that. It's a constant battle. And all of that has a very negative uh, influence on your ability to recover. Let's backtrack for a moment and take a look at the big picture. Ontario has the highest auto insurance rates in the country, yet according to Transport Canada, injuries from car accidents have been cut in half over the past 20 years. Where is all the money going? Well, I would say that uh, claim denial isn't cheap. It costs money to deny claims, and that's where they spend the dollars. Uh, we have a system here that depends on the insurer medical examination in order to qualify you to access those benefits. So that, that's not a cheap system, and, and it is something that's run right across Canada. They're called IMEs, uh, insurer medical exams, or IEs, insurer examinations. Insurers spend more money examining patients than they do treating them in, here in Ontario. And it's significant. And it's been going on for, uh, well, for a decade anyway, uh, that the dollars spent just looking and assessing those injuries is far greater than what they're spending, or e maybe even equal to on some years, than what they're spending on treatment. So that tells you where the interest is. The interest is in denying the claims. And so they make a lot of money when they don't have to pay you anything. And they'll dress up the package. The package is dressed up to be buy extra coverage so that you have all of this uh, if you need it. But what they don't tell you is that the odds of you getting it are really slim. Rona, according to a review of the Insurance Bureau of Canada's 2022 healthcare database, 
the auto insurance industry in Ontario spends more money each year fighting claims and disputing treatment than it spends on delivery of health care. Well, that's, that sounds about accurate. And I think that it's probably at this point, and probably maybe even always was, uh, less expensive to actually give people the treatment they need, as you promised in the contract, than it is to deny all of this. And there's, you know, this is all being underwritten by the taxpayer in a sense, because the taxpayer might not be paying for the license appeal tribunal system, which is the insurer system for uh, statutory accident benefits, but we're certainly paying for the court system. And that's being accessed as well by accident victims uh, in terms of pain and suffering. They call it tort. Uh, and that's all being underwritten by uh, the taxpayers, as is ODSP, uh, and as is a lot of the treatments that people end up trying to get through OHIP rather than through the private insurer that they paid to provide that treatment. So there is a lot of downloading going on. Uh, so the losses are bigger than they would appear on the IBC website, that's for sure. It seems to me that the insurance industry and the regulator have things teed up in a manner in which that everybody else pays first before the actual auto insurer. Yes, uh, auto insurance uh, in Ontario means the insurers are payers of the last resort. So you have to access everybody and everything before they'll pay you. There is something called the assessment of health system uh, cost transfer. And that has been in place since no fault was set up in the 1990s. Now, this is a, currently is a $142 million a year that insurers are transferring to the province of Ontario to cover the costs of these accident victims who have either fallen through the, the cracks or to cover treatments that are provided post-accident, like you get a, a, a CT scan, all of that. Now, that hasn't been um, indexed or um, increased uh, since 2006. So that's 17 years of monies that Ontario hasn't chased down because there's no way that healthcare has gotten cheaper is definitely everything is more expensive. And I think that the province has a duty to go after insurers to make sure they're paying the real costs of this because it's significant. The Auditor General mentioned in 2011 that the transfer from auto insurers to the province for these healthcare uh, systems cost was inadequate and that at the 142 million per year. Now the government's made no effort at all to increase that amount. And it's a long time, it's a lot of money that's going missing out of taxpayers' pockets, straight into insurers' pockets. They're not even paying the real cost of an accident, not even close anymore. So for all the complaining that they do about poor me and it's costing me so much to run auto insurance in Ontario, it is really based on just their own idea of how to, shake more money out of, our, out of our pockets and into theirs. Now, one of the things that we hear often uh, from the auto insurance industry, the regulator and in mainstream media, is that there is so much fraud going on in the system and that helps explain some of these higher rates and less care. That 1.3 billion loss that they say is due to fraud in Ontario's auto insurance system has never been proven. In 2012, the Ontario government formed an anti-fraud task force. And in their report, uh, they disputed this $1.3 billion loss to fraud. Uh, they were willing to say that it, it possibly could be slightly less than $800 million per year. Despite that, insurers carried on as if they didn't hear that at all and continued on with the one point, I think at that point it was 1.2 billion they said they were lost, that was lost to fraud. They upped it, they indexed it, uh, and at last count it was $1.6 billion per year lost to fraud. Now, no one ever agreed with that amount of money. It was, I think, just a fantasy plucked straight out of the air, and they used it as if it was a fact. And I think if you say something long enough, People will believe it, and they'll actually repeat it. So this became like a mantra for Ontario's auto insurers that we were losing these, this big amount of money every year. It simply wasn't true then. It's not true now. And we're not hearing much about it anymore. Uh, but I think it's firmly implanted in the public's mind that there is a lot of fraud around Ontario's auto insurance. And it's coming... I think they believe it's coming from claimants and perhaps from providers and people that are, are surrounding 
auto accident victims. But I don't think that that's true. I think right now uh, we have uh, car theft uh, is out of control in Ontario, and that's certainly real. But I have no idea where they got that amount and how they, why they would index it and why they would put this out in a public domain as being a fact. So that, that, that too is something that gave the insurers an excuse to up the premiums. Rona, you mentioned the cost of arguing over care and legal disputes far surpasses the cost of providing the care itself, and that does seem to bear out. What role do you think the regulator plays in this imbalance? Well, I think somebody has to take some sort of action to clean up what is a very dirty system, a very corrupt system uh, that often it gets critiqued even by judges in our uh, in our civil court system uh, i think their i think their role should be to monitor what they're reading in in these decisions if they would read them uh, and i think that they also need to um, bring in the various government agencies that are involved in auto insurance because Fuser is not the only player here. We have the Attorney General who oversees the LAT or the um, License Appeal Tribunal hearing system. And we also have the Minister of Finance who is in charge of the auto insurance file because it's considered to be a financial um, item. So all of these players need to be brought together and they need to figure out a way to, how to protect accident victims from these shoddy IMEs that they're subjected to. Uh, we have some members who have seen upwards of 50 doctors in order to um, have, their, have their injuries assessed because the insurers have very deep pockets. The insurers will keep going assessing your injuries until they get one of these assessors to say what they need to have them say or him or her say. Uh, I think that's that's a, a very big problem and it undermines uh, any hope of recovery because these, these medical reports are literally without value. So it sort of flies in the face, I think, of what Pfizer presents to the public, which is, you know, value-oriented uh, product that, um, you know, you, you can have faith in and, and all of that doesn't make any sense when you actually see what's going on on the ground. So there are big problems with these IMEs, uh, the quality of the IMEs, the, the tenor of the IMEs, the wording, um, there's ghostwriting, they, they call it, where someone just takes your report and, and you know tweaks it. So it, change a word here, change a word there, you go from getting the benefits to not getting the benefits. It doesn't take very many words to change. Um, so I think, that they all need to take an interest in this. We are, after all, accident victims are patients. We're not just claimants. We're not people out just looking to, to make a buck. We are patients. And we should be treated with the dignity and respect that every patient deserves. And that's completely forgotten in this system. So FISRA does have a role to play here, even if it's to bring all of these various parties together and to have discussions about what they're going to do to fix it. So Rona, if changes aren't made, what does the future look like for accident victims in Ontario? Well, the future is not bright because the future is a, a lifetime of poverty, really, because you'll end up on ODSP. The system is designed to take advantage of that. Uh, and that's well below the poverty line. Um, you do have about five years to pick up on, on some income replacement. Uh, but that too is below the poverty line. So the entire system now is below the poverty line. It's not paying enough at any uh, level, um, whether it's the treatment providers who are, or attendant care. That's another one where uh, attendant care are, are being paid below minimum wage. That's what they're allowing. So they have a real weird system there uh, where you add up all the amounts and uh, the amounts of minutes that, are, that the insurers allow for people to get attendant care. And then you add that together and pay for what you can because the amounts that are allowed are around $14 an hour. But our minimum wage here in Ontario is at $15.50. So you can see the shortfall. So I think this is more and more going to happen that... 
Insurers are counting on the claimants themselves to make up the difference of the things that they won't pay for. So that doesn't bode well because you'll, you'll be less likely to recover because there, we see no indexing on the uh, MIG or the minor injury guideline. We see no in, indexing on uh, income replacement. We see a fast track into ODSP. Um, we see a slim hope on the federal level that they'll come up with a Canadian disability benefit, but it's still a slim hope that that'll be anytime soon. So it's a lifetime of poverty. And you, our system in Ontario, we, for instance, don't offer uh, physiotherapy within the OHIP system. Uh, not targeted physiotherapy anyway. So, you know, there are a lot of uh, interventions, medical interventions that people might require after a car accident um, that are have to be privately funded. And that's why we pay auto insurance. So if you can't get that care and you've got a brain injury, you're going to have a really hard time going, going forward. And that's the future for all drivers. So whether we take a path towards private, uh, continue on the road with private insurance or we take the path towards public insurance. Something has to change, something has to give because the taxpayers can't afford to keep going the way that we are. So it's not just the claimants that will lose, it's the taxpayers too, because when insurers don't pay, that's who pays, the taxpayers.